often talk about、um, individual cases, people who have recovered on their own, or people who have failed the treatment. And in a way, it seems strange that we do that. I say that because there are a lot of other people who comment on problems in treatment and comment on natural recovery. And none of them ever discusses any individual cases, even though Maya Salovitz, Mark Lewis, Gene Heyman, even though th- these cases are constantly appearing in the media,、um, <clears throat> and so that's my way of explaining what we're doing here tonight,、um, <clears throat> and our general approach. We select from the news very often prominent cases. Uh, and today we're going to talk about natural recovery and failed treatment. And if the ideas that we have make sense, they should apply to actual human beings who we can all observe and that can all strike a chord. And in particular, <clears throat> we have a difficult case to make.、Um, the case that we make is that、uh, everybody in America. Everybody, when they hear that somebody has died via a mental health or a suicide or a drug-related incident, that oh, they should have been in treatment. <clears throat> And in fact, it's rarely the case that they haven't been in treatment. That's just the way things work in America. And taken on a larger scale, America's most treated society in the world for mental health and addiction. No, no place comes close. <clears throat> And we have among close to 200 nations worldwide, they've been studied、um, in the global burden of disease. The worst mental health,、um, suicide, and drug use outcomes. What's this paradox do to? And、um, we have to make the difficult case. We present a form of treatment. We have a coaching program, the Life Process Program. So we feel that people can be assisted. But we don't feel that people are assisted by the standard mental illness medical treatment paradigm, and we have a lot of people agreeing with us, including Thomas Insull, who was one of the biggest backers of that approach. He was the head of the National Institute of Mental Health, and now that he's retired, he's abandoned it and said, "You know, the mental health system doesn't work."、Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> we're going to take a couple of cases to- today that we're going to talk、mm-hmm. about. And we're just going to say what could have been done in a better way. How could we have supported them in a more positive way、um, in a treatment mode? And somebody who emerged from a treatment mode and succeeded without a treatment mode. So, with that backdrop, Zach, why don't you begin with somebody, unfortunately, who died recently at the age of thirty-four? Yeah, I don't like when we talked about Matthew Perry. And today we're going to talk about Aaron Carter. I don't really want to talk about them because I'm I have fatigue from reading the articles and hearing the news about them. However, everything you said, thank you for introducing that. That's exactly it. But it I have a lens now, especially since talking to you every week for the past year, of、uh, watching these potential case studies for natural recovery, and、uh, you know. Either somebody accidentally talks about the natural path a person could have taken to recovery, or nobody does at all. And、uh, I think that was the case here. I'm going to purposely. I, I mean, I I don't have to plead ignorance about all the details of his life. I don't really know them. I mean, it, Aaron Carter wasn't a person I really kept up to date on, but from what I know in the news stories that the information that's been presented, I can find from that, and I think people listening will find. There are contradictory statements and stories、uh, about what you know what's said to be going on. As you said, Aaron Carter was 34. He was the brother of Nick Carter,、uh, who was off, obviously a famous musician, and often said that Aaron Carter, although famous and、uh, talented musician, was kind of riding his coattails and hadn't made it to the level of success that his brother had. And at, at 34, he Was found dead in his home. Well, first of all, there's no official report on what killed him, so I'm not. I have nothing to comment about that.、Um, but it was also reported that there was 
there were inhalants and prescription medications, some of which I think it, it sounds like some of which he was prescribed to and some of which were prescription medications that he was taking not, that weren't prescribed to him. And so what news media has done or what people spinning a narrative about his death have done is point to his mental illness and his addiction as doing him in. And I also have nothing to argue or really say about whether his mental illness or his addiction did do him in or not. What I'm interested in is what that means to people when they say it. He, um, Aaron Carter came out about mental illness in 2019 and maybe before that, but, it, but, you know, it was really being covered in, in 2019 and he was talking about how he had, um, what do they call multiple personality disorder? Bipo now? Uh, bipo he was bipolar, wasn't he? Uh, maybe that, well, I think he, I think he was diagnosed as having schizophrenia. And I think he at least, I think somebody gave him the diagnosis of dissociative personality, uh, dissociative identity disorder. I, I'm, I'm flummoxed about how you get a read on that or what that even means. And he had some, like a generalized severe anxiety disorder. And so when he talked about his mental illnesses, he, he described going to psychiatrists who had prescribed him medications for for all these things. Actually, the list of medications his psychiatrist had prescribed him. Um, oh yeah, you're right. There was there was bipolar and all of that too, and multiple personality disorder, which I think is called uh, dissociative identity disorder now in the DSM. Schizophrenia, acute anxiety. I could have just read it here, and he was prescribed. Through the course of that treatment, Xanax, Seroquel, Gabapentin, Hydroxazine, Trazodone, uh, and something else I can't pronounce, Omeprazole. So things, various medications that were ostensibly treating his mental illness. Now, I already have a way of thinking about that. I'm curious about when he went to psychiatrists or went to treatment for mental illness, whether somebody asked him about his life in general or not. I'm guessing... To some extent, there was a conversation about it, but it sounds like, uh, as nor as per usual, the MO of psychiatry is to respond to diagnoses of mental illness with uh, medication, which he was taking. In addition to this, he was self-described, I mean, self-proclaimed that he had an addiction. And even though he was doing these various drugs, he never mentioned that these drugs were a thing he was addicted to, i.e. taking drugs that are causing, in a way that are causing impairment and distress in his life. His, his go-to was inhalants, usually like household sprays or cleaners or things like that, that people are using and he, you know, would let him hallucinate or totally check out for minutes at a time. And that was becoming hard for him. So he checked in to rehab this his most recent bout of rehab, which he was planning to do, would have been his fifth time in drug rehab. And when I was circling back on, you know, his death and his his brother, Nick, saying things like, you know, sometimes you want to blame a person for their actions, but in this case, the only thing to blame are his mental illness and addiction. I got interested in that. I thought, well, you know, what's his history with addiction? And just a cursory glance, um, I saw a few different articles and they're like big name. Uh, it was like New York Times covering covering things, but also like E! News and whatever the TMZ and things like that. And I caught a clip also of him on that show, The Doctors. You ever watch that? Ever see that? Yeah. Um, and they had a psychiatrist of his on and also their own shows. Um, psychiatrist, psychologist, mental health expert, talking about the fact that he smoked marijuana and why his smoking weed was um, something that he should really bring to the surface. The reason they started talking about that is, here's what they're trying to say. And this is really the crux of what, what I'm trying to talk about here. Um, well, because he was huffing, because he was using inhalants, the theory is he had depleted serotonin in his brain. And so in order to 
reconcile that he had to um he had to remain abstinent from drugs from illegal drugs including marijuana and so he then on the stage said well that's funny you say that because i'm actually going to go to rehab to quit uh smoking cannabis because even though it you know calms me down i feel like that's i don't need that in my life it's probably causing more problems than needed okay they also said well you got to go to rehab if you ever relapse on inhalants or after you quit smoking cannabis and you ever relapse again you have to go to rehab because remaining abstinent and finding help in rehab is the only way you're ever going to repair your brain to get back to normal um and then at the in the same breath those same psychiatrists and mental health experts are saying and remember due to your mental illness schizophrenia dissociative personality disorder anxiety you have to keep taking all those medications, important medications that your uh, psychiatrist has prescribed to you so that your mental illness isn't going to surface again and, and cause havoc in your life. And to me, those, those things uttered in the same clip are so contradictory that I couldn't fathom it. Um, it seems like to a lay audience, maybe to most people, it's just so digestible. Like, yeah, that hit the note. Like you're, you're supposed to take the medications your psychiatrist prescribes. Yeah, that's right. You're supposed to remain abstinent from drugs if you've ever been addicted. That's, that's right. But then I'm, I'm it's so funny. The first thing I'm thinking is, what is it about those drugs that were prescribed to him that live in some different universe, you know, light years away than the drugs that he was taking on his own, like cannabis? to relax himself. That's number one question for me. Oh, but maybe a more interesting and fundamental question is what the hell? Uh, nobody on that show or nobody from at least what I have seen reported has seemed to want to talk anything about what's up in his life, what's eating you and what don't you have and what are you looking for? How could you get it? No, that's not, that's never been part of the conversation. It's not sexy. Uh, people don't want to talk about that. And that's what I'm interested in. So I thought maybe we could just, just some of the key things that we know, not knowing much, but some of the key things we could know from just reading, reading articles about him or knowing about his life as a star, you know, you, you can kind of imagine what things are besetting him in his life. And you can kind of see some of the reasons that he had to want to be alive. We, to put this into a broader picture, you and I find ourselves in a universe of circumstances where people defy common sense and say the most illogical things it, it combined with one another. As you point out, they say, well, stay away from drugs, but take these drugs. Um, the thing that I was talking about to introduce this is, we say, well, you must get into treatment. Uh, this is a guy who had treatment up the wazoo. He's on doctors, he's consulting doctors, he's been diagnosed every which way. And you and I, I often, when I give a lecture, I say, can you do me a favor and forget every single thing you know <laughs> um, that you've learned about addiction and mental health? And we'll just talk about things in a totally commonsensical way. We'll just look at the situation in front of us, we'll avoid any labels, and we'll just ask questions about the person, not the drugs and not the diagnoses they have. Do you think you can do that with me? And people claim they can, but they can't. Um, I don't know, I do a, a anti-Gabor Mate routine, <clears throat> And one thing I, I describe how Gabor, as they know, asks, is there anybody here who feels they've had an addiction, but they weren't traumatized? And then some poor slob raises his hand and Gabor says, shows how they were really traumatized. They didn't realize it. And I say to the audience, what does that prove, do you think? Um, and I, what I'm hoping to get is somebody who's able to say, well, you could do that to anybody in the audience and find out that they were traumatized. 
you could do that routine with anybody. And then I'll use this as an example. Was Barack Obama, did he have a traumatized childhood? You know, his father, he didn't have any connection. He wrote two biographies about trying to find his father. He, his father was completely absent from his life, except he showed up, uh, he, was, he, he was an African public official. He showed up at one point and he complained that Barack watched too much television. So Barack, Barack Obama, somebody was as traumatized as anybody. I mean, losing, not having a father, that's pretty major. <clears throat> and so I say, what is it, what does all of this tell us? Let's just break this down to the basic human components about people's lives and about how people get better. So you and I are engaged in the task of extricating people from the mental health diagnosis and treatment system by way of trying to help them. We're, mm. We have a therapeutic goal, but it just happens to run counter to the way it's done in the United States with such great fanfare. So anyhow, you were gonna get into describing his background, which has some ne notable negatives, starting with his brother, Nick saying, I don't know, he's jealous of him and he was derivative of him, you know, some typical family conflict kinds of things. Yeah, well, by, by the way, I was trying to think about myself, you know, sometimes I work with families and, and they'll ask me before going into a meeting, but they start to get the vibe that I'm like a common sense guy. And I'm listening to them. They'll start to ask me, well, you know, these scary people that we're about to talk to, what should, kinds of things should I ask? And I'm, I think about that a lot. I have that lens. And I'm thinking about Aaron Carter being told that his serotonin needs to grow back or whatever the hell. And, you know, I might ask if I were him, um, how long does it take for, the, for it to totally come back? What will that mean then? Once it's totally back, then what? Can I just start acting like a normal person or is there something about me that's broken? Just just to kind of to cut into the the story that has been built around him. And I, I mean, that's just such like a common question that doesn't even get to the root of it anyway. Um, yeah, so I here's what I know about him. It's very little. You might know even know more. I just he was a star since he was seven years old. People knew his brother before they knew him. Um, and I imagine that being a star at seven and trying to navigate between who am I in the performance world as people are, as the spotlight's on me in relative to who my brother is. And uh, am I in, you know, why am I in this? And is this important to me? And how do I handle the stress and expectations? We've talked about child stars before. That's, there's nothing that needs to be inherently traumatic about that experience or like that can't be um, a, an adaptive way of growing up, <clears throat> but you could imagine some of the, the barriers that could be there in trying but to navigate. was he first diagnosed, do you know, with whatever? You know, I'm not sure. The, and I, and I, I mean, probably could do a little more digging on it and find out. I, I'm not sure when he was first I mean, diagnosed. He was probably pretty young because he was a young star, 10-ish, and he got into trouble before too long, which is an unusual for a kid that age. And then he was saddled with these diagnoses that he was laboring under. Unusual, doing offbeat things or not responding. <laughs> right. Oh, sure. And then you get a diagnosis instead of, well, let's see where we're going here. He was, uh, he's bisexual. And he came out Talking talking about his sexuality, I, I think slightly earlier on than he was talking about um, his mental illness. So right around the same time, not very long ago. And I think that that was something he's described that weighing on him, trying to balance, okay, you're a childhood star. Who am I in general? With the added burden of um, being worried about expressing who he is sexually. Like I'm attracted to men and I'm attracted to women. And should I tell people that or should I not? Should I suppress that or should I not? I haven't had that experience, but I understand that that is a difficult road to navigate. And on top of that, um, right, he started getting in trouble, um, including a DUI. And so spotlight was on him. 
who's this guy, child star, following his brother's footsteps, uh, is questioning his sexuality, who's now getting in trouble. And add on, his sister died um, from some kind of a drug mixture. He, he would be calling an overdose. Um, and I think his sister was his twin. So, so he's had his struggles and he has this kind of narrative about himself with all these difficulties, with these diagnoses, you know, ways of responding to the difficulties. Um, I don't know that he ever figured out exactly who he wanted to be or exactly who he was. I don't know that he ever got totally grounded. He had domestic disputes with his partner who he had a child with. Um, so he had, and, and then he got a restraining order against him, placed against him from uh, his brother, Nick. That's a lot of stuff going on. Still at the same time, if you, if you take a glance, it's like, like I always, like I tell my high school students sometimes, if you want to get to the truth of an article, even in, even if you think you're reading something that's bullshit or spinning a narrative in New York Times or Wall Street Journal or whatever, always glance at paragraph four and look for the words to be sure. And then whatever comes next is actually what the article is about, the facts. And uh, there's a to be sure in all these stories. And the to be sure is he loved his kid and he was really trying, he says, and I believe he was trying to get his feet on the ground for his kid. I don't know about, it sounds like he had a pretty destructive relationship with the mother of his child, but it sounds like he was trying to get his feet on the ground for her too, because he liked the idea of having a family and being a father. And I think he felt like that could give him an identity and some purpose. And he wanted to rekindle with his family. And he still was a musician. He said that music was joyful to him, creating it, producing it. That was like a, a huge boon in his life and something that he lived for. So skill set, and he was still a pretty prominent person. I want to jump lanes right now. Okay. Um, one of the women he is, if you look him up in Wikipedia, mm -hmm. one of the women he was involved with is Lindsay Lohan. Mm. We've <laughs> just written a blog post about Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay Lohan is 36. And our blog post is called How Lindsay Lohan Got Normal. Because her life was kind of parallel. She was originally booked with the Ford Agency for uh, Models, like when she was like five or something. She started appearing on television the same age that he did, uh, as a 10. She was mainly known as an actress, but she had a whole musical career. And then by her early 20s, she went off the rails. And there's almost a decade of stories about Lindsay Lohan's bizarre behavior, drug and alcohol induced. And then at one point she did an eight part series with Oprah where she called herself an alcoholic and she was in rehab. Mm -hmm. She had gone down this same route as him, um, early stardom, you know, great ability, um, screwing up in a self-destructive way, getting inhaled into the treatment system. And then she rejected all that. I don't know if she did it explicitly, but she stopped talking about herself as an alcoholic and an addict. And somewhere along the line, she started these Greek beach clubs, which sounds like out of left field. You go, wait a second. But it's funny when you read interviews about it, some of the employees say she's kind of a stickler. <laughs> you sort of imagine, well, somebody's made a lot of records and uh, movies. They're probably pretty punctilious. You know what I mean? They know how to get things done. And now at the age of 36, she's just starring in a new Netflix movie. <clears throat> she's just gotten married. Um, she doesn't talk about herself as being an addict or an alcoholic anymore. Um, in fact, there's a write-up in Cosmopolitan, and it makes it as though that period where she had a lot of problems was because the press was hounding her. They don't refer, the word addict and alcoholic behavior doesn't show up. 
it's almost like they're backfilling. They're sort of saying, well, she had all those problems, but she wasn't really addicted or an alcoholic. That's the way they get out from under it. Right. The same as we often talk about Drew Barrymore, the youngest addict at the age of 14 in the cover of Peel magazine. Now she's kind of normal. So everybody sort of forgets what they were saying when Drew Barrymore and Lindsay Lohan were teenagers and in their early 20s as a way of saying, well, OK, they're fine now. And what Lindsay Lohan has done is just build up her career. She has business connections. She's had, she she had a stable fa- she had a big problem with her father who was a recovering alcoholic who was pushing her in that direction. She's close to her mother. She has younger siblings. She had that beach club thing. She's acting in movies and she's married. She's normal. And what she's done is she's reconstructed the basic fundamentals of her life, and that's how we approach helping people. We say. People aren't helped by having diagnoses and drug treatments, except to the extent that those allow them to level out and to be able to actually pursue um, standard ways of grounding themselves and creating a positive life structure. For you and me and the Life Process Program, there's no alternative. We're about creating lives we're not about diagnosing me- and treating mental illnesses. That's the fundamental distinction we're talking about. And so he'll be used undoubtedly as an example of the destructive effects of mental illness, but he was sucked up into the mental illness treatment system. He got treated as much as you can get treated. You, you're kind of saying, not only Lindsay Lohan is an example of what we were talking about in terms of grow, you know, outgrowing some of your worst problems and then leaving behind the labels that came associated with her character. You're also saying that if Lindsay Lohan had died at 34, then we'd be saying that talking about the same story. Well, this girl didn't have a chance. I mean, she was mentally ill. She was addicted. Her father was addicted. I mean, so, so there was no really escaping for it. And that's the monster that addiction is. It takes an otherwise could be normal person and leaves them with no chance. And that's what people are saying about Aaron Carter. I mean, they're, they're saying he had all these mental illnesses and these addictions, which left him with no chance. Even the best rehabs, which we know work, and it couldn't help him. And he was about to do his fifth bout. And I mean, the, he was just left with. And that's, to, yeah. that's how you and I, uh, we want to comment. The American mental health and addiction system uses its failures to justify itself. Oh, look, he was mentally ill. We said he was mentally ill. No wonder, no wonder he's dead. And so that it's like uh, they can't lose. Um, well, it's true. We couldn't help him. I mean, he did get treated and nothing worked, but you know, that's just how bad the mental illness he had was. As though nobody in the history of the earth has ever gotten over these kinds of problems, you know? And America right now is at record levels of death by drugs, alcohol, and mental health related issues. The America, for the first time in history, in the last hundred years in history, our lifespan has been reversed. We're declining in the length of our lifespan um, alone among economically well-off countries. And we're sort of trapped in this way of thinking. It says, well, it's not our fault, just the same way they're saying it wasn't his fault. What can you do? People have mental illness and addiction. They're going to die. Now I'm thinking about if I'm talking to him, you have a conversation or if I'm working clinically at a clinical level with him. And he was telling me some of the things that he was saying days before he died. I've talked to people in the situation before where people say, and we've talked about this, where people say, um, I don't think that my drinking's a problem. My spouse thinks that my drinking's a problem. And I care about my spouse and our relationship. 
so transitively, my drinking's a problem. And he was, he seemed to be saying something similar with cannabis. I kind of like cannabis. I'm not supposed to be smoking cannabis. People in the courts say that I need to stop smoking cannabis to be with my son. I'm going to stop smoking it. And so I'm going to go to this rehab. And I might even, I, I might just like lay that back to him. You, you kind of think the rehab thing is dumb or you're unsure why you're doing it, but you know, you want to see your son, your son's important to you. Tell me about your son, you know, that, and you go from there, you pull, you think forward about what's life going to be like. That's even an exercise that we have when you have some of the things that give you purpose in your life to a greater extent than you have them now. Same thing with music. What's it going to look like when you're out of this rehab thing and you're rekindled with your son and you're starting to think about family because now you're building, you know, some structure and, and family system. Now, what's it going to look like to do the things that you love? And what does it look like to start rekindling if that's what you want to do or, you know, talking to people again? Are things going to be more stable for you? What will that look like? And just pull go from there. I can only imagine what he might say to me, but that's how I would start. That's the frame I would start with and allow him to build it up in an so optimistic way. Fundamental parts of a person's life. We imagine their goal. We talk with them about their goals. We imagine what it'll take to get there. We ourselves don't talk about substances other than if they're interfering with a appreciate achieving those goals mm. and so if somebody said to us they smoke marijuana at night that made them relax and they could sleep better we'd say nothing you know the same as if somebody told us that about wine the same as carl hart says he take heroin before uh, uh, a night before a big meeting where it was going to be a very tense um but of course thrown into this mix is the drug policy issue He's under court supervision and he's not allowed to take marijuana. And I've had clients where that was the whole, there's a Yiddish expression, Gansa Gadilla, where, you know, they're saying, well, my ex-spouse is smoking marijuana. And, and the way in this day and age, you usually work that out is, well, he won't smoke marijuana when he's meeting with the kid. That's the way it's usually done. Not like he's got a marijuana addiction He'll never smoke marijuana again. You know, the court has a right to sort of guarantee that everything's kosher by their standards. Mm. And so we're in the business of helping people figure out how to navigate their lives to create a reward structure. I mean, where was he going to go with all of these diagnoses and this dopamine bullshit? At the age of 34, that's what you were asking him about. How is that a, a roadmap for living? Well, people will say, um, yeah, okay, the cannabis thing. What about his, you know, he was huffing, he was doing inhalants. And so the uh, drugs that could cause harm immediately. I mean, that, then, then that's just a harm reduction question and a values question. You know, what will happen to you if you like thought nothing about it and just like whenever you wanted just huffed some kind of fume into your body. Now, what are the what could be the consequences of that? Okay, or do you have a reason why you wouldn't want those consequences? And um, yeah, I, I think that if from a harm reduction uh, standpoint, that, we're just chopping on harm reduction. We'd say, well, in general, is marijuana better for you than inhalants? I mean, you know, let me ask you that. As the person, I think medically, most people would think the answer is yes. Well, if, okay, fine. I mean, you could do that. That's a that's a replacement thing. But I'm just talking about the marijuana. Like cannabis wasn't what people are saying was the the hardcore thing that was his issue. It was more so inhale like total oblivion with inhalants. I think most people would actually might actually say no, no matter where they come from. Well, at least cannabis is better, um, except for those psychiatrists, I guess. So maybe not. They were saying that you got to quit that too. But 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 I'm just saying if he still had a problem with something else that could cause him harm, I might, you know, I might then say, you've tell me about the steps that you've taken to get to where you are now. The pluses, the fact that he's lost money, all of his money before, and he's actually so has so many resources and so many skills that 
he's the kind of person that even when he loses all his money, he doesn't have to worry because he's going to make more money. Um, so, you know, what all, all that stuff. Plus, OK, you've got a kid that you're pine that you're longing to uh, have under your auspices. So there's a value system that, you know, potential pulling from a value system, considering the drugs of his choice or possibility of doing them again and starting to get from it's ruining your brain. It's making worsening your mental health to don't you want to stay safe for yourself and for your kid? How do you stay the most safe? And then the, the mental illness thing, I, we have a question that, that we ask it's in our written modules about depression. Are you depressed? What makes you say you're depressed? And Hey, are there ever any times things you're doing that guarantee for the most virtually guarantee you're not depressed while you're doing them? And people always answer. There's always, there are always things like I'm running or I'm painting or I'm whatever it is. How come like depression being what it is and all just like ubiquitous in a life of a person with depression. And so, and it could come at any time. What's going on with you're so engaged with this thing that, like every time you're engaged with it, you're never depressed. I would be no, very interested in so undermining the whole depression diagnosis. If it's something in your brain, how is it that when something in your daily life is in another direction, that whole diagnosis goes away? Do you ima ever imagine yourself being on the panel with the doctors? Yeah, doing all this. I do all I, the time. I guess the first question I would say to them is. Start with the most, have you ever heard of harm reduction? I guess I would say to the doctors, and I, I, the simple answer is, well, some things are worse for you than others, or there's some things are worse for some people than others. Uh, you know, along, among the hierarchy of bad things, he, he died. He did something, uh, we don't know, some combination of things he was doing at 34, that's, that's impossible. People do the worst things to themselves to manage to live. Um, is there a, among this array of things we've been discussing, is there something that you would say, well, you know, that's less harmful than the others? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, all, all to say I've been long winded and you've been doing a good job anchoring me in, in what we're talking about. All of this to say, I could imagine any aspect of anything that he was doing, sort of mooring the issue to the to the concept of this is what's going on in my life this is what i enjoy this is what i want how do i get more of that the things that are important to me it's very it's too dumb to say it like that but that is it's what i'm like, saying that's almost what we're doing with the life process program and i've said this more than once well our part our business partner who's a tech guy once said well all you're saying is just common sense <laughs> That's the worst accusation against us. Right. And that's what that's what I'm uh, we are imploring people to to pursue is common sense and to uh, and to junk everything else they know, using your words. So that's um, it's a sad story. Obviously, I didn't you know, I didn't follow everything that came out from Aaron Carter, but I understand that he was beloved by fans even when he was in its uh darkest hour and it makes me sad to see that um you know a person's life is painted for them um after you and you and i i we, i began this discussion by saying well maya salovitz mark lewis gene Heyman never ask about individuals this is an individual tragedy it's the, the height of arrogance for us to say oh we could have saved him we don't have no idea yeah right right however it's worth reflecting on what alternatives routes might have been used that potentially could have offered him a chance to continue in life. And it begs the question, which um, I might title the, this episode, is it possible that the therapies that he received did him in? I mean, is it if he received no therapies or if he had somebody who was asking him at least at first pass, asking him some of these questions and helping him in this, you know, normal, this normal life channel kind of way. Um, could that have helped him along rather than him being where he is now? 
I can't make an accusation. I don't know. It's just this is a template that we've seen. And I think sometimes it's more clearly the answer is yes, the, the disease ish therapies are probably were much more harmful than they were good. I, I would imagine in this situation that's true as well. But it's we'll, a daring thing for us to say, but we we've seen it happen. Yeah. And dying is a, a bad outcome. Okay, so that's it for, I, I think we ha- almost had to say something about it uh, this week. And so thank you for entertaining the idea. And thanks for your insight. Pleasure.